Nuclear power is objectively the safest way to produce electricity that we've discovered so far. It is extremely reliable. It's also a clean form of energy production. It produces fewer greenhouse gases than solar, about comparable to wind. So nuclear power has a lot going for it. But anybody who tells you that their solution has no drawbacks is either ignorant or lying to you. And nuclear power is no exception. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Reason to Doubt, your source for all things skeptical. This is Jordan, and though Jared is here with me in spirit, he's not going to be joining us today in audio, which means that I can make this episode about anything I want. So for today's podcast, it seemed to me there's only one choice. Just like for our energy future, the only option is nuclear power. Now, if the thought of nuclear power sends shivers down your spine or conjures images of three-eyed fish, you're not alone. According to a 2016 Gallup poll, 54% of Americans oppose nuclear power, and it's really not hard to understand why. When most people think of nuclear power, they think about Chernobyl or maybe Fukushima. They think of nuclear power plants spewing radiation into the environment, and you know, everyone knows that they produce tons of deadly waste that nobody knows what to do with. You know, everyone knows these things. Well, if you're part of everyone, then today's podcast is for you. I'm going to start by explaining what nuclear power is and how it works. Then I'm going to try to convince you that everything you've been told about nuclear power is at best misleading and at worst outright false. Far from being dangerous, nuclear power is safe, clean, and reliable. Now, after this, I don't expect you to immediately call your congressman and demand we build nuclear plants, but it would be a lot cooler if you did. Before we begin all that, though, why the hell should you listen to me? What do I know? Well, I'm a nuclear engineer. I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering, one degree, two disciplines. And I work for a power company that runs several nuclear plants. I support those plants in my role, though I am not currently um, in a nuclear engineering role. I'm a data analyst for them. So with that said, standard disclaimer, I'm not a representative of my employer, my alma mater, or anyone else. The views and opinions I express are mine alone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't necessarily consider myself an expert. There's a lot of people who are way more knowledgeable than I am, but I like to think I know more than your average citizen. So with the preliminaries out of the way, let's start. What is nuclear power and how does it work? Well, with most power sources that aren't, say, wind or solar, the way that power generation works is you have some sort of method to create heat that could be burning coal or wood or perhaps natural gas or oil that will heat up some medium, typically water, but not always. That heat, in the case of water, produces steam or maybe it heats up a gas. Either way, that turns a turbine. The turning of that turbine produces electricity, which then goes out and powers your computers and coffee makers. Other power generation methods like uh, hydro or wind also have a turbine that's turning. It's just not steam that's doing it. Of course, solar has its own mechanisms. So that's how power generation is done in general. When you get to nuclear power, really the biggest change in kind of a broad strokes way is just where the heat's coming from. Instead of burning coal or natural gas, you're causing nuclear fission, which is then heating up the water. That water uh, will, sometimes the water that's being heated up will boil directly. Sometimes that water boils other water. But either way, at some point, water boils. It then goes on and it turns a turbine, which creates electricity. The way fission works in the reactor is you have what are called fissile materials. That's your uranium or plutonium. Those Fissile materials are things that are likely to fission when they absorb a neutron. So when uranium-235 fission or absorbs a neutron, it is likely to fission. When it fissions, it'll break into two or more pieces, releasing a bunch of energy and also releasing other neutrons that then goes on to do more fission. You can control that reaction in a lot of different ways. One of the ways you can do it is by introducing things that absorb those neutrons. So you may have heard on perhaps the Chernobyl HBO special or somewhere else that they might insert control rods into a power plant, into a reactor. Those control rods are made out of a material that will absorb neutrons. And since the neutrons are being absorbed in the control rods or whatever, they can't then go on to do more fission. 
that's one of the ways in which you can control the reaction. Now, after you've done the fission, you have those fission products. Those are two or more isotopes, which are themselves radioactive, meaning they will decay over time, just like uranium and everything else decays. That process cannot be stopped. So fission can be stopped uh, by reducing the number of neutrons you have in your reactor. The decay of your decay of your fission products cannot be stopped. That's governed just by physics. It's just going to happen. And the amount of decay you'll have will decrease over time. The amount of this decay heat is actually quite significant in a mature reactor. It comes out to somewhere about 5% of the overall heat produced. It's sufficient that if you didn't take any heat away, it would be enough to melt the reactor fuel rods all on their own. And the fuel rods are long, thin rods with pellets of fuel in them. In commercial reactors in the United States, that's typically uranium oxide. It's a ceramic pellet, but that all the, the details aren't important. The important thing is that if you melt it down, bad things happen. So that's how nuclear power is supposed to work. Unfortunately, things don't always work the way they're supposed to, and nuclear power has had several highly publicized mishaps, the big three being Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island. So given those mishaps, doesn't that mean that nuclear power is dangerous to use? Well, first, we have to ask, what do you mean by dangerous? In this context, one way to think about it would be how many people die as a result of producing electricity in a particular manner. This is an analysis that's done by researchers. Uh, you can Google the death footprint or the deaths per megawatt hour. A paper I'm going to be referring to was done by Brooke Alonso et al. They published in the peer-reviewed journal Sustainable Materials and Technologies in 2014. And their paper was essentially arguing for nuclear power, but I've checked their figures in terms of these death numbers, and they're consistent, not just for this one paper. This is the one I'm citing, but they're consistent re relatively across the board. So they quantified this, the safety of these power sources by looking at the deaths per billion kilowatt hours. So that's how many people died to produce a particular billion kilowatt hours for electricity. And for scale, uh, annually, humans produce about 23 billion kilowatt hours. So it won't surprise you to learn, probably, that coal is by far the deadliest, causing 100 deaths per billion kilowatt hours. And that's averaged over a long period of time. Other fossil fuels are better, certainly not great. Oil, for instance, has 36 deaths per billion kilowatt hours. Natural gas has less than that at four. You're probably not surprised to hear that fossil fuels kill people. You know, people inhale the smoke or the smog, they do the mining, all those things you'd expect. It may surprise you to learn, though, that the safest power source by far is nuclear power. Even if we take into account and credit the very worst accidents, that's including Chernobyl and Fukushima and everything else, in addition to all of the other deaths that are caused by producing nuclear power, nuclear power has a rate of 0.04 deaths per kilowatt hour. That's below both wind and solar, who have 0.44 and 0.15 respectively. So if you simply wanted the safest way to produce power, meaning the way that will kill the fewest people, you'd go with nuclear power. Now, if you ignored Chernobyl, and I'll explain in a minute why that might be reasonable to do, the number of deaths per billion kilowatt hour for nuclear power is virtually zero. Almost nobody dies to produce it, as opposed to other power generation sources like coal or even wind. So how can that be? You can probably imagine how coal would be dangerous. You might even be able to imagine how like hydropower could be dangerous, say if a dam burst or something. But how could a windmill can't kill anybody unless it like falls over on them or something? Well, there's a lot of factors at play here. One thing is you need a lot of windmills to produce energy. Each of those windmills not only has to be built, so you have to mine the materials you need to construct that windmill, and then you have to construct it, which comes with dangers. They also have to be maintained, so people can fall off the windmill when they're maintaining, and that happens from time to time. So similar things, people aren't falling off solar panels, but similar things are true for solar panels in terms of mining and installation and all that other sort of thing. Nuclear, by contrast, produces a relatively huge amount of power in a small footprint. You just don't need that many nuclear plants to produce energy, and you don't need that much fuel. You don't need to mine much in order to produce it. The fuel they use is extremely dense from an energy perspective. The fission energy, when you fission even a single gram of uranium, 
that'll produce about 24 megawatt hours of energy over the course of its lifetime in, in the reactor. And that's equivalent to about 10 windmills from a single grant. So you can see just how much energy there is packed into an atom of uranium. You only need about six grams of uranium doing fission to equal the power output of a windmill, for example. Another fact is that the nuclear industry, at least in America, is extremely safety focused. That's not to say that people who install windmills or solar panels are reckless or anything. It's just that while it is impossible to eliminate risk completely from any power generation method, the nuclear industry is held to extremely high standards in regards to safety. Everything is double and triple redundant. We've got extremely strict reporting requirements. Another thing to keep in mind as I'm going through this is that all of the things I'm talking about, these are statistics with the reactors as they exist today. These reactors typically haven't been built in the 70s and perhaps 80s. These are old reactors with old technology. We call it Gen 2. Gen 1 being like the earliest research reactors, Gen 2 being what we have today. It's literally decades old technology. If you go into a control room, they've got like like knobs and like levers that they're pulling in order and like glowing buttons like you had in Apollo 1, you know. So th this is old stuff and we're still maintaining this level of safety. Now, so I'll I'll talk about the future of nuclear power a little later, but just keep in mind through all of this that these things are being achieved with very old tech. So objectively speaking, in terms of the number of people who die to produce electricity, nuclear power is safer than any other power generation method full stop. That said, pictures and reports of Chernobyl are still scary. You know, it's still big and flashy. It's kind of like uh, how airplanes are safer on the whole, but airplane crashes are big traumatic things. And if we build more plants, wouldn't it just be a matter of time before we have a Chernobyl-like event in the U.S.? Well, no, not a Chernobyl-like event anyway. Fully explaining what happened at Chernobyl would take an entire episode or more on its own. And you can look up other sources for that. Many of you are probably familiar with the HBO special, which I haven't seen, but I'm told did a pretty good job. Or you can find tons of videos on YouTube. So I'll just give a quick brief overview. In short, in the words of one of my professors at VCU, he's told the class, if I ever ask you on a test, what went wrong on Chernobyl? And I give you a multiple choice thing. Just go ahead and mark every single thing because they did everything wrong. So real quick, what went wrong at Chernobyl started with the design of the plant. They used the RBMK design. It was a boiling water reactor. And it was a reactor that had what's called a positive void coefficient. So what that means in practice is that as the water that was in the reactor, which was used as a coolant but not as a moderator, as it boiled, voids would open up you know, from the liquid being turned to steam. Those voids would have the effect of causing the reaction to speed up. So it's producing much heat by boiling stuff, and then that boiling is causing it to go even faster. Now, in Western reactors, we have the opposite thing. We have a negative coefficient. So that is a safety feature that naturally pulls the other way. As the reaction gets faster, it has a dampening effect that would naturally slow it down. And the reverse happens to also be true. And so that makes it less likely to spin out of control. In addition, the control rods that we talked about before were tipped with graphite, which for physics reasons will speed up the reaction in this case, they were tipped with graphite so such that when they were inserted into the reactor when things were going out of control, at first, they actually sped up the reaction in the bottom part of the core. So they were trying to stop the reaction by inserting those control rods and it actually had the opposite effect. Then a test, so that's the design stuff, a test was being performed at Chernobyl. They did this test without a nuclear engineer present, and they disabled the automatic safety systems, a bunch of them in order to conduct the test which put the core into an unstable configuration prior to them even starting the test. Then they did it and shut it down. You can read all the details later, but they basically did everything they possibly could wrong in order to virtually guarantee there would be an accident. And they also had insufficient containment, so after there was an accident, they didn't have the multiple layers of containment that Western reactors have. It was a perfect storm combination of bad design decisions, 
downright criminal disregard for reactor safety, just awful up and down the board. It, it, comparing Chernobyl's operation to the reactors we have in America or Canada and saying that because Chernobyl, these other ones are unsafe, would be like pointing to an exploding back alley meth lab and saying that because of that, we should manufacture drugs at regulated pharmaceutical facilities. The two are just just totally different beasts. A much more salient example, if you wanted to go that route, would be Fukushima. That accident led to a few deaths compared to Chernobyl. It's questionable how many exactly were directly attributed to Fukushima, but it's small. Possibly single digits, not more than double. Most of the deaths in that area occurred due to the earthquake and tsunami that happened at Fukushima. The accident did result in the plant being lost, however. There were a lot of factors that led to it, and it should be noted that there was a sister plant further down the coastline that underwent the same disaster and didn't melt down because it had different design decisions and they reacted to it better. But the ultimate cause of the meltdown at Fukushima was a loss of on-site power. This may sound weird, but if you lose power at the power station and the reactors shut down, you can't keep up the systems that are having to cool down those rods that I talked about. And so they have some systems they can use without power in order to keep the rods cool, but eventually those failed and the rods melted down. That is a necessity in the outdated Gen 2 reactor designs we have today. Speaking of Fukushima, you may have heard that there was an explosion. There was. There was also one at Chernobyl. These were not, I should point out, nuclear explosions. So it's not the same as a nuclear bomb. Simply put, nuclear power plants cannot have an explosion like a nuclear bomb can. There's several reasons. The easiest to explain is that they're just not enriched enough. The uranium in a commercial reactor is enriched usually to about 5%. The uranium in a fission bomb would be upwards of 90%, so it just can't happen. What they had were called steam explosions. So when the heat is going out of control, it produces a lot of steam. That steam reacts with the zirconium that is surrounding the fuel. That produces hydrogen, which then explodes. All of that could have been avoided. Well, it could have been avoided by citing their generators not below sea level in a lot of other ways, things that don't apply to American reactors. It also could have been avoided by using a Gen 3 design. The newest designs are very varied. They have a lot of different avenues of approach, but one thing they all have in common is an emphasis on what's called passive safety. So the cooling of the core after shutdown is handled passively. There's no active system that requires power or human intervention in order to function. And so because it's passive, it's far less likely to fail. There's a lot of different designs. One of them that has a passive safety feature would be GE Hitachi's ESBWR. That is a boiling water reactor where the water, the heat from the from the decay that you're trying to get rid of will cause natural convection in the water in the reactor vessel which uh, leads to a heat exchanger at the top of the reactor vessel, and that natural convection is enough to cool down the rods. Another design are molten salt reactors, where the core can't melt because it's already melted. The fuel is already a molten salt. And if they lose power for any reason, there is a plug of the same material that is kept cold and in a solid state through constant application of refrigeration. If they lose power, that refrigeration fails. That plug is melted, and then the whole thing, core and all, dumps into a tank, which is safe and you know, keep, is configured in such a way that it'll shut down the reactor. So, all of that is to say that Chernobyl was a terrible disaster, and so was Fukushima. Chernobyl did cause deaths, but it was that back alley meth lab. Fukushima is much more salient to modern nuclear power. It didn't cause many deaths at all. So, bottom line, you're not going to die directly from a nuclear reactor, statistically speaking. But even if you're not going to die from one, what about all of the radiation that it puts into the atmosphere? I mean, you've seen probably pictures of the big concrete towers at a nuclear lab, like Simpson style, and you've got the white stuff coming out of it. Uh, What about all that? Well, under normal operation, there's a lot of safeguards to stop the radioactive materials from inside the core where the fission is happening, from being released to the environment. The white stuff you've seen, that's just steam. Those are cooling towers. 
that water that has never had any contact with anything inside the core. So there's no radiation there. Uh, radi nuclear plants are actually held to extremely high standards as to how much radiation can be released to the environment. Per the NRC, which is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the people who govern nuclear power in America, if you live within 50 miles of a power plant, you'll get about 0.1 micro sieverts per year. Micro sievert is just a unit of dose for radiation. For scale, that's about what you get from eating a banana. Three Mile Island, which is the other nuclear disaster I've mentioned yet, was happened in America, and it led to the loss of a plant, but it led to no deaths and only a 0.01 millisievert dose to the public, which is six times less than an x-ray. So very little radiation released to the environment, even in the worst case scenarios. One other piece of scary lingo you might hear is, if you're talking or maybe hearing a report about a nuclear reactor, is this word critical. So it sounds scary. Like if I told you the reactor is going critical, you might <laughs> think that it's about to explode or you maybe you should run away. Uh, when you tell a nuclear engineer that the reactor went critical, the answer is, well, gee, I should hope so. Because all a critical reactor is, is a reactor that has a self-sustaining nuclear reaction such that the number of neutrons in one generation is the same as neutrons in the next generation. Basically, it means that the reaction is neither increasing or decreasing. It's steady. That's what you want. You want a reaction that is predictable and constant. The other ways a reactor configurations reactor could be, it could be subcritical. That means the power is going down. Maybe you put in control rods. So, you know, the power is going down because that's on purpose. If you designed a reactor that was only subcritical, you wouldn't get anywhere because it wouldn't have any fission going on. The thing that is perhaps closest to what people think when they think, oh, the reactor is going critical is super critical. And all that means is that the reactor is speeding up. The thing you need to be worried about is if your reactor goes prompt super critical. That modifier prompt is scary and it's bad and it should never happen. It's what happened at Chernobyl. Uh, <laughs> if your reactor's gone prompt super critical, you're going to have a bad day. There are a lot of there are a lot of countermeasures we have in place to ensure that never happens, and there are even more countermeasures that affect in a Gen 3 reactor. Anyway, if you hear that a reactor went critical, it is a scary-sounding word that just means everything's the way it should be. So to summarize so far, nuclear power kills far fewer people per kilowatt hour of energy produced than anything else, any other electrical generation method, including wind and solar. The radiation exposure from nuclear plants to the public is tiny. Objectively speaking, nuclear power is the safest power generation method we have, even if you include all of the accidents to date. The next big thing that looms in people's minds is the nuclear waste, which I'm going to call by a more specific term, spent fuel. Uh, basically, the fuel after it's been irradiated in the core and it's spent, and that will help distinguish it from what's produced from nuclear weapons development. We have stuff hanging around from the Manhattan Project, which is also nuclear waste, but that's a whole different kettle of fish. So to understand the spent fuel problem, let me first bring you up to speed about how fuel is handled in America. We have what's called a once-through fuel cycle. The uranium is fabricated. The uranium is fabricated into pellets after being enriched, and it's sent to the nuclear power plant, and it's put into the core. And it sits in the core, doing fission, producing energy. Each time the uranium fissions, it splits into two or more radioactive atoms called fission fragments, and those start to decay and produce heat radiation. After about four and a half years in the reactor, the fuel rod will have been spent completely, and it'll be removed from the reactor during a refueling outage. The plants refuel about every 18 months, but they only actually take out a third of the core, and they just move everything else around. So the rods, after having been done with their useful life, they're still quite hot due to all of this, the decay from the fission products, that decay heat. If you just threw them on the ground at that point, they would melt. So you can't do that, obviously. So instead, they put them in large pools of water, uncreatively called spent fuel pools. Those pools of water keep the 
rods cool as the decay continues to go on. And over time, radioactive decay drops off exponentially. So after some period of time, it's usually about 10 years that the NRC has approved as short as three years, the rods will cool off enough that they no longer will melt on their own and they don't have to be kept in a pool of water anymore. So at that point, you can transfer those fuel rods into what's known as dry cask storage. And they are casks that are dry, meaning there's no water. Basically, they're big metal vessels that are filled with an inert gas. The rods are in there. It's welded shut, so there's no way in. And you then take that, you put it in a thick, like several foot thick concrete tomb, and then you stick that thing outside in the parking lot. They're called, uh, the one I'm thinking of are called New Homes, N-U-H-O-M-S. And once you stick it out there, that's it. The fuel rods just hang out, happily decaying away. They're still highly radioactive at that point. If you were to breach the security at the power plant and then find the pad where they're kept and then break through the reinforced concrete and then go on to break the metal container and pulled out a fuel rod and hugged it, you would be super dead from radiation. But behind all that metal and concrete shielding, you don't get any appreciable dose standing near one. You can stand one near one of those new homes ta- casks and you'll be fine. There's a vent at the top for heat removal that I probably wouldn't recommend you sleep on it for any significant period of time, but the casks are passively safe and they don't require any human attention in order to stay safe like that. So we have a temporary solution that can keep all of the spent fuel safely contained, not leaking anywhere, not harming the environment or anyone. But even so, that's not a long-term solution. We need something better that'll go for the life of these rods until they're no longer dangerous for anyone. Now, I specified all of this is how it's done in America. And I was particular about that because that's the way we do it here. But nuclear power isn't just done in America, and other places do it differently, and I'd argue much better. For example, France reprocesses their spent fuel. The fuel after it comes out of the reactor actually has a lot of useful energy still left in it. And so they have a process where they essentially take out the plutonium and unused uranium and put it into new fuel. And that serves the function of reducing the amount of fuel they need to mine out of the ground. It also reduces the amount of waste or spent fuel that they have to store. But even after that reprocessing, at the end of whatever you do, something is going to have to go into the ground and be disposed of. And isn't that a problem? Well, to explain how that is done and why it's not an issue, or not an issue we don't have a solution for, I have to first explain a little bit about how radiation works. So the first thing you have to keep in mind is that radiation isn't like cooties. If you get hit with some radiation, it's not like you're radioactive, and it's not like a virus, you're going to spread it to someone else. Um, so if you get your x-ray, it's not like you're glowing green later. Uh, the colorful analogy used in the industry is you've got radioisotopes, which emit radiation as they decay. They spit off particles as they decay. And so the radioisotope is like the poop, and the radiation is like the smell. If you're exposed to the smell, you don't have poop on you, you have the smell on you. And if you move away from the poop, you'll stop getting the smell. Uh, You have three means of protecting you from radiation. You have distance, time, and shielding. Distance works because... Radiation follows what's called the inverse square law. If you double your distance from the source of radiation, you will quarter the amount of radiation you receive. You can use time. The amount of harm a dose will do to you depends on how long you've been exposed to it. So if you just reduce the amount of time you're exposed, that can help. And then shielding. If you put something thick and dense between you and the source of radiation, you can block it, basically. So if we take the spent fuel... And we can put it far away, that's distance. We can keep it away from people so they don't walk around it, that's time. And put stuff between it and people, that's shielding, then it won't hurt anybody. That's easy. You you could do that by just digging a hole in your backyard, right? Well, the danger is that the control rod, or sorry, not control rods. The danger is that the fuel rods may not stay where you put them. Not the whole rod, but if water got into where you, you buried it, then water's friendly stuff, and it likes to mingle with things. It could eat through your whatever container you use and take those fission products, that radioactive material, and then carry it away to somewhere else. 
that water that is now has radioactive material in it could be absorbed by plants, and then the radioactive isotopes could enter the food chain. You wouldn't necessarily die instantly from being exposed to that because it would be diluted at that point, but it certainly wouldn't be good. We don't want that. So for all of these reasons, we have to be very careful when we're disposing of spent fuel. The going way of doing it is not to launch it into the sun or anything dramatic like that. It's basically to dig a hole, but like super deep this time, called deep geological disposal. This is not a theoretical thing. It is being done currently. A good example of that is at the Onkalo Repository in Finland. You can Google that. It's O-N-K-A-L-O. And basically, they have tunnels that they've drilled deep into the bedrock, about 1,400 feet down, after you spiral all the way down. And they've done careful geologic surveys to determine there's very little or no water intrusion through this rock. So there's no water like leaking it, which is important. We want to keep the water away from the radioactive material so it can't be carried away. That's the whole game. They've dug down. Then they have a bunch of tunnels going through this bedrock. They take the spent fuel and they put them in sealed copper containers. They put that container in a borehole drilled down in the bottom of the tunnel, about 30 feet apart, so they're separated. They backfill that borehole with clay, and then once it's filled up, they backhole they backfill the entire tunnel with clay. And they use clay because it's impermeable to water. So that will take care of any water that happens to come in. So there's a lack of water flow in the bedrock to start with. Even if somehow water does get in there, it's stopped by the clay, and that clay will protect the metal canisters. And inside the canisters, the rod themselves are still intact, more than likely. And so that's another layer of protection. In this way, the spent fuel rod should stay safe and contained for tens of thousands of years long after the radiation has dropped to a safe level and there won't be any issues. The Onkalo facility construction has been progressing smoothly and they expect to be operating as soon as 2023. So this all sounds great. We've got a technical solution that'll keep the dangerous material stored far away from human beings and any plants and animals for as long as we need it to. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, why don't we do something like that here in the U.S.? Well, I can tell you the reason isn't. It isn't because of money. The United States government long ago committed to building a long-term storage facility for all of the nuclear waste produced, for all the spent fuel produced by the commercial fleet. To pay for this initiative, they imposed a tax on every watt of electricity produced by nuclear power. And all of that money went into something called the Nuclear Waste Burial Fund. That fund currently has $43 billion in it. Every American who has gotten power from nuclear energy has paid for these facilities. It actually has gotten to the point where uh, the justice wing of the government ordered the payments to stop because essentially the nuclear industry and the ratepayers were paying for something, a service, the long-term storage of spent fuel that they weren't getting. But it's even worse than that. Because the DOE, the Department of Energy, is paying the nuclear plants for storing the fuel that the Department of Energy promised to store. So right now, the spent fuel is in those new homes casks or those dry casks that I mentioned before, and that costs money. And so the DOE is paying nuclear plants to do that. So far, they've paid about $7 billion, and that number is expected to exceed $30 billion before we're all said and done. So not only is it not a good solution. It's actually cost, costing people money, and we have the money to solve it right now. So, so so, if it's not money, and it's not the engineering knowledge, what is stopping us? Well, it's you can sum it up in one word. It's politics. If you wanted to use two words, you could say political will. Nuclear power is unpopular, and it's difficult to get the federal government to act on unpopular things. On top of that, There's a strong not-in-my-backyard mentality surrounding the storage of nuclear power because people fear having a geological storage facility for spent fuel in their state. And that's just there's no evidence at all that this is any danger. Hopefully, at this point, I've convinced you that we can keep this stuff safe. And if you want to learn more in detail about the specifics, you could Google Yucca Mountain and hear about the whole tawdry affair. And I'll also put sources in the podcast. But the bottom line is... There just hasn't been the political will to get this very important thing done. I think 
and this is my opinion, we might have better luck if we simply made it uh, put the onus on the nuclear industry rather than the government. If we made it just part of the cost of doing business, that's how they did it in Finland, and they've actually got it done. But that's a whole other conversation, and that would require legislation to change. And the bottom line is it's just not being done in America, but we have a way to do it. We know how to do it, and the spent fuel, even without that long-term solution, is being stored safely in America. And we could do it permanently if we ever chose to. So at this point, I have hopefully addressed the principal fears you might have when talking about nuclear power. You now know it's safe to operate. Uh, It's safe because it kills the fewest people of any power source, even if you include Chernobyl and Fukushima and Three Mile Island, and that's less than even wind and solar, that those are also very, very low. Nuclear power has a lot more going for it, too. It's reliable. The plants in America operate about 90% or more of the time, and that's compared to rates of 60% of the time for fossil fuels, and even lower for wind and solar, they have intermittency issues. It's clean. It produces fewer it produces fewer greenhouse gas emissions over the entire lifetime. That's from start of the plant to decommissioning and onto the grave. At, it produces the greenhouse gases at a rate comparable to wind energy, which is very low and is much less than photovoltaic solar, which is itself much, much less than any fossil fuel. So this is probably the point where if you've ever had a conversation online about nuclear power, and it was with a nuclear power proponent, the nuclear power fanboy probably stopped there because there is a small but extremely vocal contingent of rapidly pro-nuclear advocates on the interwebs. But anybody who tells you that their solution has no drawbacks is either ignorant or they're lying to you. And nuclear power is no exception. Every solution has drawbacks. For wind and solar, it's the intermittency. The wind isn't always blowing. The sun isn't always shining. The battery backups you have to have as a result of that, the changes to the grid that might need to happen. But they have a big advantage in that their fuel is free. You can't beat free. Natural gas has advantages. They're quick to dispatch. It's proven technology. The fuel is very cheap right now. This advantage is that it produces greenhouse gas emissions and it is therefore warming the planet. Nuclear power has all of the advantages I've been talking about. One of the principal disadvantages, except, you know, leaving aside the whole public opinion thing and the aging fleet, it costs a lot of money to build a nuclear facility, particularly in America. It is a huge upfront capital cost, which is a hard pill to swallow, and not everywhere can do it. They also have a history, unfortunately, of going way over budget. Part of the reason for that is we just don't build them very often. And because each one is built kind of fresh, basically they're being built by people who've never built a nuclear reactor before, and they're being built with a brand new design that's never been done before. Pretty much every design in America is unique, and that means it's more expensive. Contrast that to how they do it in France, where they have about 70% of their energy is produced by nuclear power, and they have, I believe it's three different designs, a large amount of standardization across the entire country, which made it cheaper. There are other things that the nuclear industry is trying to do in order to make things cheaper. Gen 3 reactors being passively safe, not being super high-pressure environments that require a lot of extra safety systems, that can help reduce costs. There's also a push for things uh, like small modular reactors. So a small modular reactor is just what it sounds like. It is a reactor that is small. Um, In this case, it produces less energy. So a large-scale nuclear power plant like you might be seeing on TV produces something like 1,000 megawatts, whereas an SMR, small module reactor, might produce 100 megawatts or even less. The definition goes up to 300. Some reactors go down as small as 60. And the idea is because these are small and modular, you could fabricate them at a factory and then ship them to where they need to go and install them in series, as many as you need, in order to get up to whatever rating you need to add more later. Uh, And that combination of things might make the capital costs up front a lot lower and might make it easier pill to swallow. It also 
uh, make it so that you can put it places where you just don't need a thousand megawatt reactor. You could perhaps install a small module reactor in somewhere like Alaska, where it's a small community, but they need power all year round, even when the sun isn't shining, and maybe an SMR could do well for that. But anyway, there's things we're trying to do to address it, but it is a legitimate drawback that needs to be addressed. It's not something you can just brush aside. But all that said, now we're all better equipped to have that conversation. And it's an important conversation to have because climate change is real. We can't keep using power generation solutions that are producing greenhouse gases that will eventually destroy our climate and our way of life. So it's imperative that we stop using things like coal and oil and even natural gas and move to safe, clean, and reliable methods of producing electricity. That will include hydroelectric in terms of dams. It'll include wind and solar. It'll include geothermal. And I think there's a role to be played for nuclear energy as well. For me, it seems the question is not solar or wind or hydro or nuclear, but instead what mix of solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, geothermal, etc. is best, and the answer won't be the same for everyone. So that's my solo show, guys. I hope that you learned something, and perhaps now you'll be a little bit less, a little bit better informed the next time someone wants to talk to you about nuclear power. You know, as you do, those conversations come up all the time as dinner parties, so now you can impress all your friends with your nuclear knowledge. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a like or a good rating on whatever platform you used to get it, whether that's iTunes or Podbean or whatever, YouTube. If you didn't like it, leave us feedback. We are always looking to improve. You can hit us up on Facebook at facebook.com slash reason, the number two doubt. And if you leave feedback there, I promise I'll read it. If you have any questions or if you want the sources, they'll also be there. And you can also leave suggestions for the next episode. We're always looking for the next thing to, to examine. Anyway, guys, thanks for your attention. And remember, until next time, you've always got reason to doubt.